I am uh, Clayton Thomas Mueller, uh, Baju Tanse, Zongibini Sienene, Tishnakas, Nigani Bini Sigabo, Tishnakas, Kinu Totem. I'm a Cree man from Pugatawagan First Nation, Treaty 6 territory, uh, which is located on about the 56th parallel on the border of Saskatchewan and Manitoba, uh, two of our provinces. And uh, my people are, are known as the Swampy Cree. Uh, uh, I guess to a lot of folks, but you know we call ourselves the people of the rock because we live on the beautiful uh, uh, rocky shorelines of the hundreds of thousands of lakes in our territories. And um, yeah, so that's that's who we are. We're fishing people. Pugatawagan, uh, in in my language, me lit is me the literal act of putting a net out in the water to fish. That's what it means. Pugatawagan. And so, uh, you know, we're a fishing people. We're also a hunting people. You know, we hunt the moose. Uh, we hunt uh, beaver and muskrat and goose and all kinds of yummy little critters. And uh, I actually just got back from, uh, from a fall hunt. So I didn't get a moose this year, but I got a couple of white-tailed deer. So I was thankful for that. Uh, to be able to feed my sons, uh, you know, some food of the land. But I just wanted to open up with a bit of introduction. You know, I don't know more was born in the winter in Canada under perilous circumstances. And, um, you know, through a series of omnibus bills, these are what's known as need to pass bills. They have put uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of riders onto these bills that have attacked the Navigable Waters Act in our country, uh, which protects you know, millions of bodies of waters in Canada um, and reduced that protection to just 80 bodies of water, uh, mostly in conservative ridings. Um, you know, and this, of course, uh, and, and all of the other pieces of legislation that they unilaterally passed uh, uh, you know, through their omnibus bill agenda. Uh, has resulted in the kicking open of the back door to big oil. Um, you know, in Canada, we're home and we have Ariel, we're very privileged to have Ariel Derange from Athabasca Chippewan First Nation joining us on today's panel. Canada is home to the controversial tar sands, which is one of three major carbon pools on the planet that absolutely need to stay in the ground. Um, they've been trying to do everything they can to uh, eliminate what they perceive as barriers to the expansion of the Alberta tar sands and its associated infrastructure. And I'm talking about pipelines. Many of you, how many of y'all heard of the KXL, Keystone XL? Yeah, yeah, so you know that's one of half a dozen pipelines they're proposing to get tar sands out of Canada. And the Harper government has you know, really done a good job at uh, almost completely destroying Canadian democracy. Um, and, you know, what ended up happening as a result of this unilateral attack on participatory democracy in Canada is that, you know, people from every social movement sector uh, began to break down the silos dividing our social movements. And certainly in Indian country, there was an overwhelming response uh, to some of the unilateral plays that Harper was making because of the disproportionate impact that this type of economic uh, paradigm has on Indigenous peoples. So First Nations peoples find themselves at the forefront of social movements in Canada and the fight for climate justice. And when we think about you know, extractive industries, when we think about the legislative agenda of, of, of the Canadian government who's in the pocket, you know, this created a tornado-like scenario that pissed off our most powerful warriors, and that's our women. Um, and the four founders of Idle No More are three First Nations women uh, from Manitoba and Saskatchewan, um, as well as one non-native sister, that's uh, Sheila McLean, uh, Sylvia uh, McAdam, um, and uh, uh, Nina Wilson and Jess Gordon were our founders. I say their names because we're all very thankful to them and the dozens of other sisters that they organized with um, to combat against this horrific legislative agenda uh, that I'm describing to you. What their workshops and their little meetings, the little grassroots meetings ended up doing, it resulted in a, a, a meme that emerged, uh, this, this meme, Idle No More, and for some reason, that motivated, especially our young people, to take political action. And what we've seen in a span of just a few short months of Idle No More hitting the scene in 2012 
was the emergence of 10,000 First Nations peoples marching on the capital city of Canada. So that is a, a, a profound thing that Idle No More has done, galvanizing our young people, our women, our elders, to take political action and to hold our government to account in this era of, of the global climate crisis. And so, you know, today we've got uh, Tori Kress, uh, who is an organizer with uh, Idle No More in Canada, uh, Anishinaabe Ikwe, Anishinaabe, uh, 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 um, what's the word? Okijita Ikwe, a warrior, warrior woman. And uh, we have Ariel Derange from the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation. Uh, she's uh, Denis Sutlene, uh, incredible organizer from her community fighting the expansion of the tar sands in her territory. And of course, uh, uh, Penny. W <laughs> I always forget the middle name, and I was like, uh, Penny Plant. Uh, Penny Opal Plant. Which is why it says Opal. <laughs> from Idle No More SF Bay. Um, you know, who's been doing incredible work here organizing the local Idle No More chapter in the Bay Area. And so, you know, today's discussion, I wanted to, you know, really open it up. Uh, we were going to, you know, have a bit of back and forth and have our sisters talk about, you know, some of the elements of Idle No More that they wanted to share. Um, you know, and before I get to, get to the first question that I want to ask our panelists, I wanted to drop a couple of stats for you all. Currently, right now, there are over 700 chapters of Idle No More that are predominantly concentrated in Canada and in the United States, but there are Idle No More chapters in places like Sweden, where the Sami are, uh, you know, taking on mining corporations and energy companies operating in their territories up in uh, Northern Europe. There's Idle No More chapters in Aotearoa, New Zealand, in Australia as well and uh, you know mostly in countries where there's a unique kind of settler colonial state you know relationship with indigenous peoples type thing and it continues to grow um, or you know this last uh, year with Idle No More, we've taken a look inward and invested much of our resources into training the many people that have wanted to step up and start organizing in their territories. And we've been able to, you know, do a tremendous amount of fundraising to do community direct support for the dozens and dozens of hotspots across Indian country where communities are asserting their territorial jurisdiction against the encroachment of mining companies, forestry companies, and of course, energy companies. And, you know, this work has been very meaningful, you know, and, and think that I think the thing that I'm most excited about, um, aside from the incredible organizing that's happened in Canada, has been the emergence of the, you know, just, just so many different chapters of Idle No More organizing in places like the Gulf Coast, here in the Bay Area, in places like Wisconsin, heck, even in Boston, we're seeing Idle No More members uh, organizing direct actions, organizing teach-ins, um, you know, that are centered in really, you know, lifting up uh, uh, um, some of the interconnectedness between, you know, Indigenous women's leadership and, of course, uh, 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 decolonization work, uh, especially focused on our young people to help them reclaim our Indigenous spaces, our Indigenous identity, and to, you know, honor uh, the sacrifice of our ancestors so that we could be here today fighting the good fight. And so I wanted to open it up uh, you know, to our panelists in a good way um, uh, and ask them to, to introduce themselves um, and maybe share a little bit about the work that you're currently involved in and how you are connected to Idle No More, which is, you know, is this massive decentralized, uh, you know, incredible social movement. And I, if we could just start with Tori, uh, that would be great. Thank you, Clayton. That was a beautiful introduction. Um, Ani Bojo Nagonsakwe Nishnakash. I'm Bovji Dodum. My name's Tori Kress. I'm Nishnabekwe. I live in uh, Mohawk territory, actually. Uh, and <laughs> I'm a Potawatomi and Ojibwe European person. Um, I am from uh, an island community in Georgian Bay. It's uh, kind of cottage country, uh, but I do live on the Mohawk Reserve. Uh, and they actually came from Quebec, and so it's actually Anishinaabe territory, but they moved there and bought the land privately. Um, so I feel quite comfortable. It is my territory. Um, I became involved with the Idle No More movement um, when the founders, who weren't founders then, had reached out to me to 
tell me about this Bill C-45 um, and if I knew about it because I was organizing an event in Toronto um, about changes to the Indian Act that the government was going to make. So they had reached out to me to ask me if I heard about it and I thought, no, I haven't heard about this. I should know what this is. I'm going to find it and print it off. And that's what I um, really uh, <laughs> stupidly and blindly did and I hit print and I didn't even check to see how many pages it was and like it just kept coming out. I actually had to leave and go to Staples and buy more paper and ink because and I left my son there watching all these papers come out. It was like over 460 pages came out of my printer and I thought I could read this and understand it because I printed off Bill C-428 and it was two pages and I was so overwhelmed and scared and shocked and, I, and that's what really um, sparked my fire to get up and, and mobilize and, um, and I didn't actually know what I was doing. I just created a Facebook event. Thousands and thousands of people came out on the December 21st in this huge snowstorm and uh, I was at my friend's house that morning and the, the RCMP, the, our federal police, phoned us in the morning and they said, there is so much snow, there's not gonna be a rally. You guys don't expect many people. And my friend I was working with at the time, Linda, said, now you listen here. We live in the weather. This is our weather, we'll be there. All your non-native activists, they'll stay home, but I can guarantee you, our people will be there. And uh, she was absolutely right. <laughs> and they just, people just kept coming and kept coming and it was the most incredible organization that I did with somebody I hadn't even met till just before the event. We pulled that off through social media and emails and Twitter, and that's how we got thousands of people to come to Parliament Hill by buses. Like, they came from across the country. They came from everywhere, and uh, just standing at the top of the hill, watching all these people come in, it was just one of the most overwhelming things I'd ever been part of in my entire life, and I couldn't believe that this just happened, and, uh, and the love and the spirit from my people was the most incredible feeling I had, and that's, you know, was my spark, and that's when I knew, I can do this, I can do so much more, although I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's exactly where I started, and I knew that people needed help, and um, I became more involved. I came on the national team, working on social media, working on communications. Now I'm working on fundraising. Clayton's done a lot to teach me how to do that. Um, and uh, I'm pretty excited about that work. And the fundraising that we're doing now is because uh, of people like myself and other people from around the country, actually North and South America, that don't really, they reached out to us asking, you know, how do we mobilize? How do we mobilize? And I, I didn't have an answer for them. I didn't know how to help them because I didn't know how to really write, I didn't know how to write a, a press release or a media advisory, so um, that's, you know, what we're working on, because there's so many people out there that have to do an action, like, on the spot, they don't know, because, like, Elsie Pugtug, it was instant, they had to stop those thumper trucks from coming in for the seismic testing, and how do you organize if you're not sure what you're doing. So um, right now we're fundraising and looking towards supporting those women that are out there on the ground, on the front lines, that need help with the social media. They need help getting the word out. They need to learn how to write press releases, how to develop a website, how to effectively use a Twitter account, how to reach people the best they can through a Facebook page. Those are kind of skills that some people just don't have. Um, we've seen pages not take off because the you just don't know how to do it. So we're looking to support women that want to organize and, and have those skills that you just, you know, we, you don't have time to go to school and learn those things because you got to get out onto the land and protect it right away. So, you know, that's the kind of work that I'm looking at right now is supporting those women. There's women who need to know how to do that. They've specifically asked, how do I do a webinar? How can you teach me how to do a webinar? I can't teach them. I just learned myself. I still haven't even done one on my own. So the women need the training. So that's what we're looking to do and build them up, build up those leadership skills so they can also share them with other people that come to them. It's networking and strength the women through the training so that's you know what I'm looking at that's what I'm trying to help support so yeah thank you <laughs> so we'll hear from Ariel my name is Ariel Duranger. I'm from the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation 
Um, I'm a little bit different than Tori and Penny because I'm like, not like in an official, I don't know more chapter. Um, but it's a decentralized movement. And, um, you know, we're, we've all become idle no more. The, the, the whole idea behind that name is that our people had signed these treaty agreements in Canada and we believed that they would be upheld because we upheld our part of the bargain, which was to let them share our land with us and live in peace with us and not have the American Indian Wars that were happening here in the United States. Those were the foundations of our treaties. And we, you know, our elders told us over and over again, they will live up to this agreement for, for, for a really long time. And, you know, we got, and when people did rise up, they were oppressed with the heaviest hand possible. You know, past systems were put in place in Canada that oppressed our people where we couldn't leave our reserve lands in a time of, of, of drought. Uh, so there was no food on our communities. Um, people were starving and dying and they couldn't even go out to hunt. And there were all sorts of tactics that were in place, imposed by the government to oppress us and basically annihilate us. Genocidal tactics through policy in Canada is what they did. And so for, our, for many, many years, our people became afraid to speak up against the colonizers. And that was even further perpetuated through the residential school process. And after residential schools and the, the second generation, really our generation, to Can not- Can you just say what residential schools were? So in Canada um, and in many crown colonial countries and in the United States, they rounded up the children of the indigenous populations and they put them into schools, boarding schools away from their families, sometimes thousands of kilometers away. I Sorry, I speak in kilometers. I speak in Canadian <laughs> or actually I speak in every other part of the world except for the United States. <laughs> um, and uh, so thousands of kilometers away from our, our, our families, our cultures, our territories, and they tried to school the culture out of us. They tried to rip it out by, by forbidding us to speak our language, cutting the hair of children, and trying to force to assimilate them into, and culturally indoctrinate them into the Catholic um, system. And, and uh, they were literally taking children as young as five years old and taking them away from their homes for, for sometimes years at a time. And so through that, there was a generation of a loss of culture and identity as indigenous peoples. And um, you know, we're like the first generations to not go through residential school. Um, and we're the this generation finding who we are. And as a part of that finding who we are, it was like, wait a second, why are we, why are we not speaking up? What are, why are we not speaking up for our people and our rights and these treaty, treaties that have been violated and breached for the last, I don't know, hundreds of years? And depending on the treaty, my treaty's been around since 1899. Um, each treaty's different. But there's been these breaches, and I mean, if we want to go back to the first treaties, it's been hundreds of years of breaches of these treaties. It's like, hey, let's not just sit here and hope that something's going to change. Let's, let's be idle no more. Let's stand up and use our voices and empower our people to be proud of who we are. And, and I think that... <laughs> and, I, and I think in that context, you know, um, that, that movement of being silent no more, idle no more, had been around. It's not like it just started in 2012. I always think it's... Yeah, it's 2012, yeah. I always have to think about how old my son is. <laughs> Uh, so 2000, it didn't start in 2012, but in 2012, what happened was there was a moment of just, you know what happened? Harper happened. Yeah. Harper and his policies happened. And so I, I kind of actually thank Harper a little bit, you know? I'm like, I, I'm kind of like, oh, I can appreciate you now, Harper, because you did something that we've been trying to do for a long time. You pissed off every single native across this country <laughs> and in the United States, and you unified us against the patriarchal and colonial governments. And I was like, hell yeah, I'll get behind that. <laughs> um, and so it was, it was really empowering for me because as an activist who's been doing this work since basically I've been born, I mean, I was, I was literally born into um, a family 
challenging governments, challenging oppressive state laws. Um, and, and so this was like, it felt like it was almost like it was never going to happen. This movement was never going to happen. And then suddenly these policies come out. And I was doing workshops too before I don't know more started. I remember doing one with Melina and Gitz in, uh, in Fort Mackay and trying to tell people about what these new bills were. And then all of a sudden, in a couple of weeks, there was like this movement happening across the country. And it wasn't just, there wasn't just 15 people showing up to your workshop anymore. There were like hundreds of people and everyone was retweeting and reposting it. And I was like so inspired and amazed and scared because we now had all these people looking for direction all looking to where are they supposed to put their energy now. And the beautiful thing about I Don't Know More was this decentralization of it, which was you have the answers. It actually empowered communities to look inward at themselves, to find solutions regionally, and try to address and break, break down those states and, and the patriarchy and the things that had oppressed their people, not just since 2012, but since the time of colonization. And it was this beautiful moment where people like were proud of who they were. Um, I remember growing up as a child being ashamed of being a native person. And I have two children, my daughter's a teenager. And I remember going to the big round dance flash mobs in the West Edmonton Mall and being with her and just seeing the pride in all of these young children's faces, to be proud of who they were as native people, like taking over like the, one of the largest malls in the world <laughs> and our drums ringing through the malls and that, pr that pride that I knew that my children would grow up to be proud of who they were. Knowing that when I was little, if people would go, who, they're like, oh, what are you? I'd be like, um, um, I'm, 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 I'm First Nations, or I'm, I'm an Indian. Oh, I literally had people say, parents say, you shouldn't bring her over to our house because we don't want you to get lice, or I'm dirty, or something like that, in my lifetime. And I think that we forget so easily the systems of, the, of oppression that have played out in our generations. And the fact that we can sit here today is because of the foundations of strong leaders that have laid out our ability to stand here, the people that continue to stand up in the face of adversity of being told that they are worthless, that they are dirty, that they are nothing. And the fact that the women of Idle No More said, you know what, we can't let these bills just be passed blindly. We have to do something and it awakened the spirit of everybody. And it was such an inspiring moment for me to feel like I wasn't alone anymore in fighting the tar sands or fighting for the recognition of my rights. And I think it was a catalyzing moment within the environmental movement because the environmental movement had been struggling to like, how do we engage with native people? It was like suddenly they were all out there saying, we want to stand up against this bill that's suppressing the environment, which is intrinsically connected to our rights. And they were like, holy shit, there's all these natives. <laughs> you know? And it was amazing. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, it was amazing, though, to be able to like, be a part of like, working with all these young people that were finally engaged and proud of who they were. Um, and, and even though I was already doing this work um, and being involved, it was so... It was so, so good to be a part of like that, you know, the title of my, my um, presentation yesterday was a resurgence or reclaiming our indigeneity. And like, that's what for me, I don't know more was, is this catalyst that gave us a platform to stand on, to reclaim who we are as indigenous peoples, not just in Canada, but in North America. And as, as someone fighting one of the largest industrial projects on the planet, it became such an amazing thing to be able to stand beside not just 15 people at a rally, but 500. And, and for me, we, we organized blockades of Highway 63, which is the main highway to all of the tar sands um, operations, something that no one in our communities would dare do even the year before. But I don't know more gave everyone the courage to stand on that highway and blockade it for a full day.
so, so for me, that's like, I don't know more was this amazing movement that, that gave me back the strength to keep going in these movements. And I think that it did that for a lot of people. So it wasn't, it wasn't the beginning of something. It was like the, the spark to, to make sure that we didn't give up. Yeah, just an interjection on that. You know, I, just the, as the only dude on the panel, what I, what I would say about Idle No More related to what Ariel just articulated is that I think that Idle No More, and we all know this, it's a manifestation of the same spirit of resistance that has carried different names over the generations, you know, Red Power Movement, American Indian Movement, Native Youth Movement in the 90s. There's been different manifestations of it. But I think the one clear difference is that Idle No More um, was a direct response to the imbalance that exists in our world, you know, this, this, this super hyped up, steroid pumped up, white patriarchal system of oppression. And the thing about, you know, Idle, <laughs> Stephen Harper. And the thing about Idle No More is that because it came from our women, it came from a place of restorative power, of regenerative power, which is renewable. You know, and it's not coming from a place of domination and control um, and, 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 you know, a destructive force, but rather a renewing uh, restorative force that, you know, truly comes from our women, you know, being the life givers, being the ones, uh, you know, and we've all heard that quote, a nation is not fully uh, 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 defeated until the hearts of their women lay on the ground. And, uh, you know, and I think I don't know more is a, is, a, is a big example of that. And it's an expression of, uh, you, know, the, the, you know, some of the contribution and solutions I think that our native cosmology and worldview have in terms of getting it right, fixing the imbalance. I wanna introduce Penny O. Paul Plant and please you know, Thanks, talk Clayton. about your story too. So um, I'm from Richmond, California, which is just across the bay. Um, I'm, my family's been in that area since the 1930s. My mother's family came from Mexico on that side where Yaqui and Mexican. My father's family came from northeast Texas right along the Oklahoma border. And on that side were Choctaw, Cherokee, English, Dutch. And there's probably a whole bunch more in that mix that I don't even know about. But I want to claim all of my ancestors because they made me who I am today. We were already on high alert about the fossil fuel industry, about Chevron poisoning our community and the other four refineries along the Northeast Bay when I don't know more rolled out. And to see all these indigenous people taking over shopping malls in the dead of winter, <laughs> <laughs> at and Christmas. At Christmas and in intersections was the most powerful and inspiring thing I'd ever seen in my life. And I was so, so happy. And on December 10th, which was that the day that Chief Tr Teresa Spence started her fast? So my husband and I, he's sitting right over there, Michael Horse. He and I um, went to the Canadian consulate, and it was just the two of us, and we stood there with our sign that said, if you're not going to take care of the land, give it all back, because that's how we feel. And I don't know if that was the first I don't know more action in the Bay Area, but it was definitely one of the first, and it was just us two, and sometimes that's how things start. So after that, I don't know more action started rolling out in the Bay Area at shopping centers, at um, city plazas, um, Sacramento, Sac um, San Francisco, San Jose, Oakland, Richmond. And, in, and then there was that Forward on Climate, um, 350.org's Forward on Climate that February of 2013. And I thought, wow, we need to be there. We're idle no more. So um, I got a hold of the organizers, and, uh, and we had a whole indigenous contingent, and our Ohlone relatives opened up the program, and we marched in the front. And because you guys showed the way, you like showed us where we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to be, and what we're supposed to do. And even though I've been an activist 
since I was in my, I say my baby 20s, in the early 80s, I started out as an anti-nuclear activist. I'd never seen it done quite like this. <laughs> and, I, and it gave me a lot of strength. All you young people, you just gave me a lot of strength and I felt like, yeah, it's time to do this. We gotta roll this out because if we don't, there might not be anything to roll out. Like we're at that point in history where for the very first time in humanity's experience on Mother Earth's belly, we can see it all spark out. We're right there. And people rising up with love and unity and power and the strength to persevere beyond the corporations and beyond the fossil fuel industry, beyond the, the laws that support the industries that are harming the earth, the water, the air, and the soil, that's what we get to do. It's our job, every single person that's alive right now, that's our job. There is nothing more important than doing that. And I feel that in every cell in my body and I'm sure that all the rest of us up here do too. And so there was that forward on climate. I'm trying to think like how it rolled out. And then there was a practice Nonviolent direct action practice at the San Francisco Federal Building shortly after that. And we got permission to do a mock, it was hilarious how it happened, a mock nonviolent direct action at the Federal Building and a training, nonviolent direct action training at the Federal Building in San Francisco. So it was kind of a trial run for later, and you know, the San Francisco police were like, sure, yeah, you can do this. And th it, was, it was a very sweet thing. And um, at that, and we did an Idle No More round dance, teach in, prayer, right there that morning before the actions, the, the so called mock action started. And somebody there, one of the organizers, said, Well, you all need to form affinity groups. And I'd been in affinity groups in the 80s, and I thought, Oh, we should have an Idle No More affinity group, right? So that was the birth of Idle No More SF Bay. And um, our group has been active, very, very active. We, I don't know how many times, well, you guys didn't even know that how many times we were at the Canadian consulate. Every time I saw something that said, you know, support us or solidarity, it's like, okay, getting on the phone, making a Facebook invite page and calling all my friends and saying, okay, we need to be at the Canadian consulate right now. They need us. We need to go there and sing and have all of our banners and support. So I don't even know how many times we did that. And then we started focusing on the refinery corridor um, and did a lot of actions at Chevron. And my, one of my favorite actions that we did there was on, um, it was part of one of Eve Ensler's events on Valentine's Day. What was that called? One million. Yeah. So um, we met in a park near Chevron and I bought a bunch of those red and pink hearts, and um, I invited all the people there to write love letters to the Sh Chevron CEO, John Watson, and we took photographs of them all, and there was somebody videotaping, and they said things like, Dear John, we would love it if you would stop poisoning our children in, in Richmond. Dear John, we would really love it if you would pay Ecuador, our relatives in Ecuador, the billions of dollars that you owe them for killing them and poisoning their communities. So it was a whole series of these that um, was mailed, they were mailed to him eventually. And um, I always think about his wife. Like, she gets this package in the mail, because he lives in Lafayette. You know, he lives <laughs> not very far from where I live but in a totally different kind of neighborhood than I live in. <laughs> and so I imagine his wife like opening this big envelope and seeing all these dear John Valentines. <laughs> and you know how us women are and going, John? So that's how our local group got started and we're still very active. How many people know that they're are five refineries 
in the Northeast Bay. And how many people know about the Refinery Corridor Healing Walks? In this room. Oh, good. So we moved to the Martinez, where there's two refineries, the Shell Refinery and the Tesoro Refinery. Right across the bay is the Valero Refinery in Benicia. And then down, um, following the delta into the bay, is Rodeo, where the ConocoPhillips Refinery is. And then further down is the Richmond Chevron Refinery. So the, the rates of asthma in these communities is so much greater than any place else in Contra Costa County where these refineries are, that it's a crime. It's a crime that these children in families that are working poor have to deal with the, this kind of asthma and autoimmune diseases and cancers every single day. They wouldn't have these refineries in downtown San Francisco or Arinda or where John, um, gosh, his name just... John, dear John lives, thank you. <laughs> anyway, they wouldn't have that in Lafayette, just like they wouldn't mine for, for uranium under Manhattan, right? Even if they found it there, they're not gonna mine it there. So yeah, it, makes, it gives me a fire in my belly. It pisses me off. The injustice pisses me off. And um, I got some white hair now, so I can say that. <laughs> I wouldn't have said that before I got a few white hairs, but I'm angry. I'm angry about what's being done to our communities, and not just indigenous communities, but all of our human family community, communities where this has been allowed to happen. So after the first year of these walks, and it's almost a total of 50 miles, and I don't know what that is in kilometers, but it's almost 50 miles. So we do one, that's, wow, maybe we should use that figure, 116 <laughs> kilometers. So, <laughs> so we do one walk a month, starting in April, one in May, June, and July. And when we first started organizing these walks, there were so many people that didn't realize that there were this many refineries in the Bay Area. And so they've been very successful on so many levels. There's, we do prayers for the water. There's a water ceremony when we start out. We walk with the water through the whole way. They're led by Native American people in prayer with one or two sac sacred staffs. The people right behind us are in quiet contemplation, and the people right behind them are in quiet conversation. It has been so rewarding to me personally to see non-indigenous people have the direct experience of how we're all related and everything is connected when the butterflies come and fly with us, when the ground squirrels came out and walked with us for a couple of blocks, when we had the condor feather with us the first time, there were vultures that were flying with us the entire way from Rodeo to Richmond. And it, you know, I'm, I'm dense sometimes. It took me a while. I kept praying about it and asking, you know, for information about the vultures. And then it came to me, well, yeah, they're, they're the closest bird that we have in this area related to the condors. They're the little siblings of the condors. And so to, to, to have people that haven't had those direct experiences have those on this walk has been one of the, the most beautiful things for me. So the first year was so wonderful that we decided to do it for a total of four years. And if you live here in the Bay Area, or if you're gonna be here, you're all invited to come. And then at the other part of the walks that are really important to all of us is that about a mile before the end, we invite everybody to start imagining their communities beyond fossil fuels, which is one of the most important things we could be doing right now. Human beings imagined all the things that are wrong. We, we imagined it all. I mean, not, not me personally and not any of us maybe personally, but it's all imagined. We made it up. And now it's time for us to imagine the world beyond all of the harms. It's our job. That's part of our job. It's the most exciting part of our job, I think. 
our collective imagining of the future of, t of tomorrow. It's just tomorrow. It's right there. I can taste it. I can feel it. I can see it. It's just right there. We can do this. We have to do this. This is our job to do this. So this is what we get to do. <laughs>